Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I'm your host, Alan Moore, and I'm excited to have XYPN member Ryan Inman, founder of Physician Wealth Service, on the show today. Ryan's firm specializes in working with, you guessed it, physicians. In fact, 100% of his clients are doctors. After meeting his wife in college, he bounced around the country while she completed medical school, residency, and a fellowship. They ultimately decided on Vegas in order to keep expenses low while he started his firm, and now he's looking for a new place to land. He is a content machine with a blog, podcast, guest content, a VIP group off of his podcast, and more. And it's all focused on his niche. He's even in a husband of physicians group and provides tons of awesome content, which continues to drive him leads. He's a great example of why having a niche is so powerful. He's two years into the business and shared his first year income and expenses and talked about how he has spent money to make money. And that's paying off. 40 clients already. He's well on his way to his goal of 70 clients, which is when he plans to stop so he can focus on being a dad. What highly repetitive tasks are you doing that take up your time and keep you from seeing more clients? Tasks like data input, building financial plans, document organization, and more? What if all of these tasks were done by a trained professional who could complete them with quality, accuracy, and efficiency? Valenta BPO provides virtual assistant and paraplanner outsourcing solutions specifically for financial advisors and the financial planning industry. Check them out at valentabpo.com to see how they can help you do more of what only you can do. You can find any of the additional resources that we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 149. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYP and radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Ryan. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for being on. I feel like I've hit a life milestone. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, and you're a great example of check your spam filters because we had played a little bit of email tag and then I had invited you to come on the show and then never heard back. So I was like, all right, well, I guess he doesn't want to be on and come to find out I was sitting in your spam filter. So... Yeah, for two months too. Sorry about that. (laughs) No, it worked out well. Well, thank you again for for taking the time. You have an awesome firm with a very well-defined niche, which we're going to talk about and and are operating just, you know, a little bit differently, which I think is ideal for the for the client base that you're working with. So I'm excited to dig into all of it. So for our listeners' benefit, can you give me just sort of an overview of the practice, where you're located, what your niche is, how many clients you have, sort of how long you've been in business, and then we'll dig into the details. Of course. So my firm is Physician Wealth Services. and I So what am, is your niche? <laughs> I work with lawyers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so Physician Wealth Services, I'm located out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And I am just approaching this month at my 40th client. 40th client. So when did, when did you actually launch the firm? Oh, good question. So I actually joined XYPN in, I think, October of 2015 and launched February of 16. And at the time, I think I was the only person that was in Nevada at the time and ended up having 26 deficiencies when I first launched. But the team and XY had helped me in that in launching. So launched successfully in February of 2016. Okay. So February 16th. So it's been about two years. And I will say Nevada has not gotten any easier when it comes to registrations. They are one of our more difficult and longest you know, process states for initial registration. So anyone thinking about Nevada, hire someone to help you with compliance because it is a heck of a process there. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I mean, even the audit that I had maybe five, six months ago was a pretty horrible experience. So just like it lives up to, it was hard then and it's still hard. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to talk to you about the audit because a lot of folks have not been through that. So just give me sort of the the rundown of how you wound your way into starting your own firm. Has this been your career doing financial planning? Yes. So I I will actually start with how I kind of got in this. When I met my wife in in college, freshman year of college, and she's a doctor. So you can kind of see how this is going to go eventually. And if you're familiar with the kind of the ways that the the lifestyle of a doctor or at least going through training works is 
your spouse that is the doctor kind of has the command on the career and where we're going, what we're doing, how things go. So a lot of my career has been shaped by her career. Hers was first, med school. You know, I traveled while in grad school every three to four weeks out to Kansas City where she lived from San Diego. Then when she finished and she had to go to residency, we moved to Orange County. We're there for a couple of years and then moved to San Diego so she could complete her fellowship. So me holding down a job for a couple of years was a good thing, not out of choice, but it's kind of how it works in a medical family. And it's just kind of a really a natural fit to work with physicians because I live and breathe it. I enjoy the same joys and same pains that they go through. I've sat every fourth night alone when my spouse is working in the hospital. You know, I see what they're pitched in terms of products. I just, I understand what, what they're going through. I, I get it. So it's a really a, a natural fit from that. But I didn't start doing that on my own. My kind of career path, I finished both my master's in accounting and financial management as, long, as well as my MBA in 2008. So we all know kind of how that worked. Great year to get a couple of graduate degrees. Super awesome. Yeah. And so I decided, you know what, let's make sure that she's the one. And I moved to Kansas for four months after five months after grad school during winter. And anyone who knows me thinks is probably laughing right now because I am a West Coast guy. I grew up near the beach and going to Kansas for the winter. While I like snowboarding, there's not really snowboarding. (laughs) Kansas has the worst, right? Because it's windy and snowy and flat. Like there's just nothing. And it's like, there's nothing to do other than going to a Chiefs game, which I'm a big fan of. But, you know, when it's like zero degrees outside and like, again, I'm a West Coast guy, not not the most enjoyable (laughs) So this was your relationship test was if if you could love her enough to be in Kansas for four months of a winter, then it was it was meant to be. Yeah. And like a 700 square foot house. Yeah. (laughs) For five months while not working. And, you know, while she's still in school, then then she's the one people don't see it that way. They think it took me 10 years to marry a doctor. (laughs) You look at it either way, I guess. I don't know. But and then I ended up working for a a fee only advisor. And I had no idea that kind of existed, you know. I did an internship at Merrill Lynch during grad school and was like, what did I do to myself? This is terrible. But it was lucky, found this advisor. He had million dollar account minimums, So it wasn't like I was working with the exact clientele I wanted to work with, but it was an amazing experience. I'm extremely thankful that I had it, but things kind of didn't fall out with the promise of, you know, hey, you could become partner and do this and buy in. And then all of a sudden it was like, wait, I didn't say that. So, so this was in Kansas City or Orange no, County? No, this was in Orange County when we moved okay. for residency. And then when we moved for fellowship, I took kind of like this temp job working in the finance department of a large apartment builder for a year. And it was literally just to save money. It was about a year and a half. And we've, we've, we got really good at basically living off of one salary and saving the other. So we were doing this quite well. And with the complete intention of me ultimately starting my firm, and just having a big kind of buffer. And we got lucky through a little bit of real estate as well as just being really good savers in order to do that. And 2015 happened and quit my job and ended up starting the firm and launching in February of 16. So how long were you with the the firm in Orange County for? A little over three years. Okay. So so talk to me about that process. So, you know, many of us, myself included, were sold on the vision of the promise of succession. XY is full. I think we have 630 failed succession plans now. So for the for the folks that are out there that are thinking, you know, having this conversation, I'm like, oh, it's a golden opportunity. How did that conversation go? I mean, was it, you know, was it just sort of a side thing? Was it, you know, it was mentioned in passing or was that really what sold you on staying with a firm? I mean, you, I guess you really didn't know about financial planning before you got the job there. So I guess just what was that process? process like? Yeah. So I'll I'll preface it with saying like, this is going to be different than most people. They were a neighbor when I was growing up and I was the kid, the nerd kid that liked to trade stocks at 13 and begged my mom to open the TD Ameritrade account so I could actually do that with my, my summer money that I earned. And he lived across the street and my mom said, Hey, you really should talk to this person. They are, this is what they do for a living. And I was like, cool. So, you know, he kind of showed me the ropes, how to trade, how to do these things. And I kind of just took it on my own, made some beer money for school and kind of just said, see ya. Like when, you know, you go off to college and life happens. And then I, you know, we were moving to Orange County and I said, you know what? Like I should reach out to this person, just see what they're doing, see how it works, see if they're hiring. And it was one of those. He's, you know, at the time he was almost 70 
And he had built a really successful firm. He never marketed. It was all kind of word of mouth over 40 years. And he's done a really great job. And he said, you know, I'm not getting any younger. And, you know, this would be great to have you come in and I'll teach you the business, everything I know. And, you know, we'll see where it goes. But my thought is after two years, you know, I'll pay you a little bit less than what you're, you should be making. And we'll just count that as your initial equity into the firm. And after two years, we'll, we'll make it official. It's like, okay, you know, I took it a handshake yeah, deal. That's a great right. opportunity. Yeah. It's a great opportunity. I'm not going to kind of kick the gift horse in the mouth. So like, whatever, like I'll, I'll do it. And you know, nothing was written. It was a handshake. And then it kind of was like, wait, we never, we never had that conversation and that never existed. And, and I was like, okay, well, you know, writing's on the wall. I'm good. We're already moving in within a year anyway for my wife's training and no harm, no foul, like lesson learned, expensive lesson, but no big deal. And just kind of chalk it up to that. Yeah. How do you think that would have worked out differently had you not, or had you actually gotten partnership, but your wife was moving? Like, do you, would you have been able to take, you know, take your job with you or would you have been forced to stay in, in Orange County? So we lived, so I don't know how familiar people are with Southern California, but in Orange County, and then you got San Diego, it's about an hour, hour and a half away. And we were living in North County, San Diego. So we were commuting like an hour South mm. and instead I would have commuted an hour North kind of thing gotcha. for 45 of LA traffic. And I mean, you never know what it is, but I just round up, let's say an hour each way. So it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Direction. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. It's, it's a little different than I've heard around, you know, actually saying I'll pay you less and, and we'll count that as part of your equity. But I think that's implied for a lot of folks. I mean, I do talk to younger planners that are saying, Hey, I've, I've been working here for five years. I'm making, you know, $32,000. Is that normal? I'm like, no, no, that's not normal at all. You should be like three times that right now. And it is because there's sort of this implied or, you know, stated trade off, which if it actually works out and it's contractual, maybe worth it, I would recommend taking a normal pay and then saving the money to buy in later if you have the choice. But like I said, it, it happens a lot. And like I said, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to have hard feelings. But my encouragement for folks, if, if you know, you're in this position and you're making really big life decisions because of it, like moving across the country or you're disrupting your spouse's career, you know, in order to chase an opportunity, like get it in writing, you know, because because obviously it worked out well for you, but that could have gone a totally different direction. So absolutely. And, and having a prior relationship with the person too made a little bit of a difference in my decision. If I had no idea who they were, I would have probably not done it. Even though I knew that, you know, in a couple of years we're moving anyway. I still wouldn't have done it. I just said, oh, just pay me a little bit more and we'll call it, we'll call it even like, I don't care about partnership, but you know, you get, you're young, you get excited and you know, you, you assume everyone will do the right thing because you, you know, I do the right thing. I, at least I think I do. And I would assume everyone would, but it doesn't happen that way. So you were there for three years. Is that when you studied for and sat for the CFP exam? I did not sit for the CFP exam actually, Alan. Oh, I don't okay. have a CFP. Oh, my bad. I thought you did. Cool. No, so, so talk to me about that decision. So what, you know, I guess, have you thought about it and just made the decision to not go that direction? Pretty much. You know, I, I look at it as, and this isn't a knock on the CFP at all. I think it's great. I think from a marketing perspective, it's amazing. I think from practicality, it could be a little bit better, but still, I mean, I, I love that people are getting it. And especially if you're coming out at school, like it's more knowledge, it's more practical knowledge that can help you out. But at the same time, I, I take the fee only thing very serious. And when I look at it, it's like, I think 15% or 30% of all the CFPs are fee only. Like, that's still a lot of people that aren't fee only that are CFPs. So how many CFPs would I recommend for my mom to use? You know, not that many. Sure. You know, it's and it's just, you know, but I, I, I like what they're doing. And, and I think from an overall standpoint, like, it's better than going and getting some insurance person that's masquerading around as an advisor. But at the same time, like, I studied really hard. I took, you know, USD where I went to school is a top 20 business school. And I have two master's degrees from there. One's in accounting and financial management. One is my MBA. I feel like I'm on par, at least, if not higher than a CFP. It might not be equal in terms of the industry and what standards we're setting for people. But for my own personal well-being and personal happiness and, and everything, I don't need the CFP board to tell me that I need to be a good person. I don't need any laws to tell me to be a good person. I am a good person. And you know, I hold myself to the highest standards personally more than anyone else could. And even at that, similar to my clients taking a Hippocratic oath, like I take, you know, I sign a fiduciary oath and give it to every single one of them that says, if there is any conflict of interest, then I will always side with them. 
so do you feel like that's held you back at all in any way or or has it been sort of a non-issue for you and your clients? Because and I ask that because it's interesting with doctors specifically who do have, you know, a, a very well-known credential. I didn't know if like they prefer credentials or they just don't care when it comes to financial planners. You know, it, it, it's really hit or miss. And I think it's in how I conduct myself and I'm, I'm confident. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. And I'm okay to seek outside help when I don't. But the CFP would not change that by any means, in my opinion. So, you know, I don't think it's held me back too much. If it has, I really haven't noticed it all that much. You know, on the fence, if I should or shouldn't still, the concept of it, I I do like it in in theory, but in in practicality, like, do I need to do that? Or can I just focus on doing the right thing, helping clients out and kind of going about my way? So I, I don't know. I'm still torn. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And you're at a stage in your business where, you know, if you if you were genuinely asking me like, Alan, what's better for my practice, sit and get the CFP or go out and get more clients, like go out and get more clients. (laughs) Obviously, we're huge supporters of the CFP because because we we like having that centralized single designation. But at this point, if you were just starting your business, I may say, oh, I think it would be helpful. And if I had known your niche was doctors, I'd be like, oh, yeah, they're they're going to need a credential in front of them. But I would have been wrong. It, so not, that's not awesome. at all. It doesn't mean you'd have been wrong. It just means that, you know, there's there's more than one way to get there. And you just need it's really comes down to confidence. And if you do have the experience and you do have the knowledge to help people, and if you don't feel like you do, it's going to show and clients are going to know and you're going to have a tough time. And I, that's not saying I, I'm a know it all because I'm absolutely not that way at all. But I'm confident in what I know and I'm confident in my limitations. And I kind of look at it as like I'm their PCP, like their primary care provider. Right. And and I'm going to know a lot about a lot of different things, but I'm not going to know the super crazy intricacies that a CPA would really know who, you know, enjoys tax code. Like I'm going to say, let's go find some outside help for this if it's something I can't do. That's the way I kind of look at it. No, that makes perfect sense. So without having gone through the CFP education, you know, the formal curriculum, how did you become knowledgeable about all the various financial planning topics and all the things that you have to talk about with clients? Well, I mean, I have the master's in financial management, so it's kind of like I did all of it. I have all the education requirements. I mean, CFP board is already kind of done. I did go down that road and kind of look at it. And aside from their capstone course, like I have done all their curriculum, but I did it at a master's level at a top 20 business school versus the other avenues you could go. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. I, I didn't realize your master's had was basically CFP education. It was so. almost all kind of CFP education. Cause that's usually the, the direction I push where I'm like, you have to know what you're doing, right? Like yeah. whether you get the exam or not, like you have to be competent. And the CFP is the, in my opinion, going through the content or the educational curriculum is the fastest way to get that knowledge. You can certainly learn at boots on the ground, which is what I was wondering if that was the direction you had gone, but that makes sense. I mean, it is kind of that, that direction, right? That's where my experience came from. So I have all the experience needed. I have all the education needed. I literally need their capstone course and to take the test, but you know, that's what pretty much my whole master's degree was in. And you know, if someone's coming out just an undergraduate degree, like I did undergraduate in accounting, it wouldn't have been enough. It wouldn't have been sufficient. Right. But the graduate degree was. All right. That's good to hear. So talk to me about the decision to launch your own firm because you've worked in a financial planning firm by then for three years. You were out of it for a little bit and then decided to start your own practice. So I guess how did how was that transition and, and why then instead of going off and you know getting a job, you know, making good money in San Diego or, or I guess at that point, Vegas? Yeah. So it was kind of one of these things like lifestyle, right? My kids are, well, now three and a half and one and a half, almost two. And I want to be present for everything that I can be. And I would really like to work from home, not commute an hour each way and kind of be more of a a better dad, if you will, in that sense. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My, I was the first person on either side of my family to graduate from college, except for I come from a really successful family. They are in real estate. They do all sorts of great things. Like they're very well accomplished in their fields and they didn't need kind of the graduate degrees or anything to, to do that. But it's kind of always been in my blood. It's like an entrepreneurial family. You don't just get rid of it because you decide to go a different path. Sure. My brother and I are the kind of the oddballs. We're the only ones that aren't in real estate. Everyone else is developers and agents and, you know, all sorts of property managers and all sorts of other things. So I always kind of knew that I wanted to do this and putting my wife's career first. And I'm totally fine doing that. Totally happy saying that. 
love my wife. I want to make sure she's happy. It's really important to me. But now it's kind of like my time. And so I looked at it and, you know, we, it's funny, we sat down and we kind of did the George Kinder life planning, but not knowing who George Kinder was or what life planning was. <laughs> and we kind of sat down and said, like, what does our ideal life look like? How do we want to structure it? What do we want it to look like? And my wife said, well, you know, I'm busting my butt training here and I don't want to work, you know, immediately right away and slave over everything, but I want you to be happy as well. And I was like, well, I don't want to be miserable driving all this way and do all these things and working for someone else. Like ultimately I want to help the people that I truly want to help. And I don't want to work with million dollar plus minimum and working on drawdown strategies and things like that doesn't excite me. I don't ex- get excited for Monday. And, you know, I looked at it and was like, you know, if I'm super excited for Friday afternoon to come and I'm dreading Monday, you know, that means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and half day Friday, I'm miserable. That's like two thirds my life that I'm not excited about. Something needs to change. So, you know, put together a plan, kind of said, well, what does our ideal structure look like for the next couple of years? We saved even more than 50% of our take home. And, you know, that was like our thing. We just saved money, made sure that, you know, things are going well and ultimately decided, you know, that we were going to allow me to quit and to start my own firm and to go kind of chase my dream and my passion of helping people and working in this field. And so far it's been working out and I'm extremely happy and blessed that it has. And now my wife is think in the next month or two going to be going back to work full time now that the kids are a little bit older. So what is her specialty? She's a pediatric pulmonologist. So children's lungs. That's not specific at all. That's (laughs) hence the fellowship. (laughs) Extremely. Yeah. So we did four years of medical school, three years of residency, and then three more years of fellowship. And it was Vegas sort of the dream of where y'all wanted to end up or is that, is there some center there that is just great for her, her specialization? No, it's the exact opposite. This is where my family's from and we did this so we could save even more money. It was literally a money play and assuming there's two and a half million people in town. And at the time there was two board certified pediatric pulmonologists. She is now the third in the whole state that she would be able to find employment anywhere. And that has been the exact opposite. Because she's so specialized, they don't have the infrastructure really set up. And the two people that are board certified, one's in Reno and one's in Vegas, they own their own businesses and their own practices with six month waiting lists. And she's not entrepreneurial at all, terrifies her. So it is not a good fit. And we're actually looking at potentially moving in the next you know, few months here, depending on where she's getting contracts she's interviewing right now. And we'll probably be leaving. But this Vegas was a complete play on uh, saving more money so I can keep chasing my dream. You know, it's just so awesome because, I mean, that's a huge decision. Like, you know, and and for you both to be on board with, hey, we're going to live in a town that may or may not be, you know, sounds like is not the right fit for her career, not the right fit for where you all want to end up long term, but it's worth it for X amount of time so you can get to where you want to be. And, you know, for the for the folks listening that are thinking, you know, entrepreneurship is easy. These are the hard choices that you have to make to be successful or or to at least, you know, contribute to your success, that there are sacrifices that get made on both sides of it. And, and this is why we frequently say you likely won't be successful if your significant other is not on board, because if your wife was ticked about like, oh, I don't care, I don't want you to start your own firm and then you move her to Vegas not going to be good for the relationship, you know? So like, these are all things to consider that, that it's not an easy road, but it's worth it if it's what you really want to do. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that, like to emphasize this, because I know you guys tried to do this, but I, I don't think it, it it's beaten over our head enough. In all honesty, this is a really tough business to do starting from scratch. No clients, no email lists, no nothing. You know, I started literally from scratch my wife had to be on board 100%, just like I was for her career. And, and you really have to love what you're doing. You can't just say, oh, I think this is going to make money or I think this is an easy job. You're going to end up hating it. You're going to end up working way more hours than you ever think. I did not know that I would probably be. And I come from an entrepreneurial family. I see what it is. And I still didn't think like, oh, I'm going to work seven days a week and it's hard to, to turn it off and <laughs> you know, go enjoy stuff. Like it it doesn't happen that way. It's a really hard grind and you need to be sure that you really want to do this because it's not easy by any means, unless your significant other is making hundreds of thousands of dollars and you can just 
not care if you're not profitable for five years. Like you probably won't be profitable for several. My guess is three. It's a tough thing. And you got to really take the time to go like, what is my ideal life look like? What, it, what would make me happy? What's my ideal day look like? And if entrepreneurship is really that and you're honest and you're real about it, then go forward and do it. If not, I almost want to say, save yourself the pain and just be an employee at a really cool place because it, it's really hard. You know, entrepreneurs are what people that work 70 hours a week. So you don't have to work 40 for someone else. <laughs> and make less money. <laughs> a, whole, a, whole, a whole lot less money. For, for a time, there's a list of pros and cons, and there are plenty of things in the cons category. And, and you're absolutely right that we were, we were very guilty, especially in the first year, year and a half of, of XY of, of doing a little bit too much, like rah, rah, entrepreneurship's amazing. And that's just where I come from. Cause I love this. Like mm-hmm. I, I truly would just get so bored if I didn't have the business stress that, you know, that, that comes with entrepreneurship, but most of us aren't wired that way. And so we, we've been pushing back more as we can, but you know, like you said, you, you were in a great position. I'm, I'm actually curious, do you know off the top of your head, sort of that first year, what your overall expenses were in the business versus revenue sort of as you ramped up? Oh, this is going to make like Michael and Sophia like cringe, but it was not $10,000. <laughs> that is all right. We see to, now to be fair for anyone out there who's seen the $10,000 budget, it is you could start it for that. It doesn't mean that's all it's going to take. And that does not account for personal expenses or any investment. Like that is a bootstrap budget that some people do, but not everybody. So yeah, I'd actually be I'll curious. I know you guys do the, like the surveys or whatever. Like I would be curious and then maybe you did it and I just missed it. But like what everyone does spend in their first year, I'm under the thought process that if I can leverage technology and money to get somewhere faster than I'm going to do it. So yeah, I was okay. You're going to invest for your future. Yeah. I invest in myself. And that means that maybe I don't invest in traditional investments completely like stocks and bonds and whatever, or even real estate. Like I invested in myself and my business. And I think it's kind of reflective, you know, at month 18, I was going, uh Oh, like, t- did I do the right thing? But now, you know, two and a half, almost years, I think I did the right thing. Yeah. So, so do you mind sharing what the, what the number was if it wasn't 10,000? No, I think it was somewhere like in the 25 range. Yeah, that's, I think that's a good range. 10 to 25. I'll say 10,000 is predicated on two things. One, your state not requiring you to put money away. So there are some states like Tennessee, you have to literally go deposit $15,000 into an account. So therefore that blows up our $10,000 budget. So, you know, and there are just some states that have that requirement. But also, you know, the, the second piece of that is that you're truly not investing in infrastructure. I mean, that's a bootstrap budget where you're just getting the basics. You know, you're not you're not going over and beyond. You're not spending a lot of marketing. Maybe you have a nat- natural network, that sort of thing. You're not getting an office. Those things can quickly add up. So I would say 10 to 25, maybe 30,000 in the first year is what we see. And actually, I, I was trying to see if I could if I could grab that data from last year's benchmarking survey. So we're doing a benchmarking survey again this year. Uh, so we're in the middle of that process. So we'll have some additional data just to see what first year expenses are. But yeah, I think it's in that range. I, we don't see people spend more than that unless they're just going out. And if there's just some particular technology like an Orion or something that they're spending 15 grand on, you know, before they're a member. But yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, I appreciate you sharing that. What was first year revenue like if, if you spent 25000 So this is interesting, but it was like $10,000. And the reason it was that low is because I was priced too low. And it was one of those things I was like, you know, I want to, and I did it on kind of on purpose. And it sounds like a lot of the stuff I do might not make sense to those. But, you know, the first, you know, I thought the first 10 clients that come in, and typically they're going to be people you know and things. Again, I came out with no network, no marketing, no email list, no anything. So I said, you know, what? I'm going to do it for 100 a month and no upfront fee. And I'm just going to, you know, be able to get my process and procedures together. I'm still going to give clients great service. Honestly, I gave them probably way too much service because I didn't have a lot going on. I think very typical in the very beginning. And, you know, still they, they're with me today. Their fees have gone up already. Not anywhere near what I'm currently charging. But, you know, I, I did it on purpose to to make sure that this was the right thing for me. This is the, the, the right way to build the business. What works, what doesn't work. I am a huge proponent of trying out technology. I tried out literally eMoney, Red Capital Advisor. I'm now back to eMoney. Uh, I think hands down they for the cost, 
it's kind of hard to swallow at the beginning, but they are so far ahead of everyone else. No offense to the other ones. They were good, but just not great. And that's just one thing. I literally test everything and, you know, having clients jump through different hoops and things like I just said, coming on board, brand new firm. I, I'm huge into technology. I want to give not only the best advice that I can to you, but I want to give you the best resources. And so we're going to be trying different things. And that is why your fee is so cheap. All of them signed up and we're like, okay, no problem. It's just kind of how it went. So I didn't have, uh, again, a, a giant book of business. I didn't start with, I didn't come from broker dealer world or anything like that. It was just me bootstrapping, but I ended up spending more money to get that done. Absolutely. So it sounds like, and this is not a mistake, but it sounds like you priced too low. You didn't do the upfront fee, which it sounds that like- That was a trend. mistake. Yeah. That, so that was that's the mistake. mistake. We'll say no upfront fee. Why, why do you feel that way? Why, why do you prefer having the upfront fee now? More skin in the game for the client. I don't necessarily care about their revenue as much as I do about them being responsive. And you don't have skin in the game. You maybe don't value it as much. You perceived value. You know, we can go on on that where, you know, you pay for something, it's more expensive. You get same kind of coverage. You're still going to value it more. But it was one of those things I didn't charge anything up front, 100 bucks a month to people making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars like that is nothing. And they didn't care as much. But you know, yeah, did you find that they, they undervalued the service you were providing? I mean, in addition to the fact that, that you're providing an awesome service, you were also overdoing it because like you said, you had time. So I mean, do you feel, feel like they undervalued that super high level service because they just weren't paying enough for it in general? I, I don't think like to my face, they were, I think it was more just timely requests. Like doctors are busy like really, really busy. They have really tough schedules. Some even more like if you're a surgeon or some of you got, you got some crazy hours or ER guys have crazy hours. But I think it was more just getting stuff on a timely basis. Like they didn't get it this month. Who cares? It was a hundred dollars. They don't, mm. they didn't, they didn't care. Fair enough. So yeah, having an upfront fee and it also protects you now that it come in the business. And I get it a little bit more like, and granted it didn't happen with, with any of these people, but an upfront fee protects you in case someone decides to not tell you the truth and, you know, says, oh, no, I'm in it for the long end and I would really like to work with an advisor long term. And then you give them a plan after a few months and they're like, ghost you. You didn't do a whole bunch of work for very, very little money. You at least have, you know, whatever it is. So if your process takes three months to get someone a plan, let's say, assume that the client leaves. Would you be OK with the amount of work that you put in from day one to day you deliver plan if they ghosted you? And if you're okay with it, like you're charging enough. And if you're like, oh man, that would really stink. I'd be really pissed and hurt and hosed and I'd make $15 an hour. Like you need to raise your prices, whether it's monthly or more likely the upfront fee. Yeah. So talk to me about your transition in pricing. So you started out no upfront fee, $100 a month. So where, I guess, what were the iterations that you've made between there and where you are today? And you mentioned the pre-call, you may even be making another shift as well. So just talk me through that sort of progression. Yeah, of course. And I, I kind of, it's funny, like, I feel like I'm a part of like Michael's grand experiment, right? I, I, he's so brilliant. And he's, you know, talking about this monthly thing. And then, you know, being able to, to do services that clients will actually pay you to then market to them. So what I'm referencing is like student debt. All, almost all my clients, I think I have like two clients that don't, almost all my clients have student debt. And doing a student loan review for them, basically, I could charge, let's say 400 bucks. And my thought is, okay, I'm going to charge them $400. They're going to come in and I'll do a great job for them. But it also be like, I can also pitch them to come on and become a client if I like them. If they turn out to be a horrible person, like I'm again, lifestyle kind of practice. I don't want to work with that person, but let's just say they're a good person. I can pitch them to become a client. Well, if you guys know anything about physicians, like they go through a lot of training, they have a lot of student debt, but during training, they make like 50 to $60,000 it's going to be hard for them to want to afford a planner. But realistically, aside from student debt, like their best advice is just don't blow up your finances and go into crazy credit card debt. (laughs) Right. Don't, don't have lifestyle creep at all. And their lifestyle creep comes like, because they make 50 to 60. Now they're making three, four, five, 600. That's the big lifestyle creep that happens like right as residency kind of ends, but residents, they don't have time. They're sleeping every fourth night at the hospital. Like, they're worried about when they're going to sleep, not much less their finances. And they just need to be on the right repayment plan and doing the right thing for their student debt and not getting into credit card debt. 
it gets harder when they have families and things while in training because there's less money going around, but more mouths to feed. But I thought, you know what? Great. I'll do this. And, and that'll be one of the service offerings. Well, guess what? I was getting all first year residents, like all interns. They can't use my services for at least three years. And if it was like my wife, six years. Well, that's a hell of a prospect funnel, if you want to call it that. So I decided that that wasn't kind of in the best interest for the firm, but I still was helping people, but I don't like one-off planning. Like I really want to get to know someone, their family, their kids, and not from like a stability from income, but just this is the type of business I want to run. I, I just want to get to know people and help people. And that one-off planning, you know, I don't do a one-off kind of plan. It just, it wasn't for me. So the iterations kind of went to, I had a lot of services to kind of paring it down to less services. And now I'm at the point where it's literally one question. I don't charge an AUM fee. So I know that some people might agree with that. Some people won't. I don't do net income, net worth, like all that kind of stuff that I know other people do. And this really kind of speaks to the niche. I literally look at and say, do you have 300,000 of assets or more to invest? And if you don't, it's 300 a month. And if you do, it's 500 a month. I have a 999 upfront fee. And that's, again, to get them kind of vested. But also, you know, I have like a, a five meeting process. I am at the very, very end of the RLP training with George Kinder. I'm in the mentorship right now. And I, one, cannot recommend that enough. And I really hope, Alan, you guys do something with George to kind of get this in because what he's doing is amazing. Like, I don't have a great way with words to say it. You have to go through it to really experience it. But he's doing phenomenal things. And I would love to see the whole profession kind of go that way. I really would because it's it's remarkable. But I have a five meeting kind of thing. I tell clients, you know, let's meet every two to three weeks. It's a little bit intensive up front. So if someone, you know, leaves after that period of time, which I hope they don't do, but I feel like I still have enough value because I charge nine ninety nine up front and then three hundred a month or five hundred, depending on where they're at. So all right. So you're doing five meetings from start to finish. And and so talk me through those meetings, sort of what the like what what your overall meeting structure is. Yeah. So the first couple meetings, even starting from like the prospect meeting, and this again kind of speaks to the niche, right? I know where they're at in the process. If someone says I am a dermatologist, I know your salary is probably 400 and above, more likely above. If you're a pediatrician, I know your salary is probably 200,000 or below. So I know, you know, kind of framing and referencing, I don't need to ask them how much money do you make? I don't need to ask them what their investments are because if they just finished training, their investments are probably zero. Maybe they did something with their 403B during training, max, I mean, absolutely max 40,000. So I don't, my prospect meeting up front is really just to get to know them, to make sure that I like them, to make sure they like me. I want them to ask any questions that they have to understand the process and, and how we go forward. My first meeting is really just a get to know you meeting. I don't look at any numbers. I don't kind of dig into anything. It's really just, you know, essentially, what kind of doctor are you? How did you become a doctor? Why did you become a doctor? You know, what did, you know, what are your kind of feelings and relationships around money? You know, what do your parents do? What does your spouse do? Hopefully they're there and they can tell me all the same kind of answers. What are your kind of your possibilities and, and what are the the possibilities coming up in the future? What are the challenges coming up? You know, kind of what just where are you guys? What what's going on? What excites you? What isn't exciting? What's really what's the reason you reached out? Most people don't wake up and be like, man, I can't wait to call Alan today. I don't know Alan, but I'm going to tell him everything <laughs> about myself and it's going to be amazing. All of my money secrets sounds like a great yeah, idea. It, no one does that, right? So what is the reason you're reaching out? Like, why are we working together? And the second meeting is really a George Kinder adaptation. I run the three questions and the heart's core grid, the ideal day, ideal year, an ideal week. And if you guys don't know those, maybe Alan can link to them show notes. But I mean, George has got such a phenomenal process and you, I've gone through a bunch of training with this, but it's a really a great thing to just start off the relationship really well, talking about who they are as a person, what their goals and aspirations are. Why are they saving money? Like if you don't know why they're saving money, how are you going to really do a plan for them? I mean, be realistic. Their goal isn't to just throw a whole bunch of money in a 401k and then die with millions like, do they want to travel the world with their kids? Do they want to pay for all the kids' colleges? Like, what do they want to do? Do they want to write a book? What, you know, what do they, I have physicians that are like, I literally want to stop medicine in eight years 
and I want to flip houses or I want to, I don't, he didn't want to do that, but you know, I'm just kind of improvising here. Understood. And I have one that's like, you literally will wheel me around when I'm 80 and I'll still be rounding. I want to work one or two days a week, but this is what I love doing. One of them said, I want to go into public health and stopping a doctor altogether. But I, you know, I'm a doctor now and I have debt and I, I just want to get everything secured. So you kind of go through all these things with them. And these questions like really help get to understand who the client is and what's important to them. The third meeting, I, I do a mind map. I look at kind of everything as a whole, get their financial life like all in one place. In the meantime, they've been sending me documents, putting them in the vault through e-money and linking everything up. So I know what's going on. I know kind of what's realistic. The third meeting, we also talk about the obstacles a lot more. So in the second meeting, if they told me like, I want to go buy a cruise ship, never rent it out and just sail around forever in this massive boat. Well, that's probably not likely. So that's an obstacle. Let's talk through it. And maybe it turns out that you don't want this huge, you know, 200 foot yacht and roll around like, you know, you're some baller like maybe it's like a you know a little 20 foot dinghy and you're good you just want to be out on the water like totally different conversation but we kind of address that in the third meeting through some obstacles the fourth meeting is really a traditional planning meeting we look a lot at cash flow planning so like my clients again younger they most likely don't even know what they're spending half the time they're like i set up auto payment on my credit card i couldn't tell you how much my bill was like as long as i didn't get an overdraft notice i don't log into my bank that literally happens. So, you know, we look at cash flow planning. In the meantime, I use Finometrica. So they're doing risk assessments. We'll go through an IPS statement in that fourth meeting to make sure that I know where they're at, to make sure they know where they're at. I use data points. Absolutely love the service. Phenomenal, amazing things that she's doing. And that kind of gets implemented throughout the fourth and then really into the plan. And the fifth meeting is just plan delivery. And then I, I typically meet my clients every quarter and go through basically, you know, all the to do's that we have, I kind of break them out over importance. And we just kind of knock them out every quarter and emailing them and calling them and making sure that things are getting done and that, you know, they're following up with the right insurance stuff and that they're doing kind of all the the things that we kind of agreed upon. But I make sure after the plan, like everything I set forward, like review the plan, we're going to reconnect in a week. And I want to know if you agree, if you don't agree, where you have problems, where you don't. And then I'll kind of break it out for the year and we meet every quarter. So talk to me about your use of data points because she has been at the conference last couple of years. I know we've got some some advisors that are using it. And so just for a quick recap, this is from the daughter of the creator of, or from the author of Millionaire Next Door, which identified, and correct me if I'm missing something, but identified sort of like the five traits or the five habits to building wealth. And then she, I believe her name, Sarah, created the assessment to determine whether or not someone has those traits in order to, you know, in order to be financially successful. So how are you using that survey and the results as part Mm -hmm. of it? No, great question. So one, there's six behavioral traits, not to, I'm sorry to correct, but there's six. And and I don't want to kind of promote my own show, but I have a podcast called Financial Residency and I had Sarah on and we literally go step by step through each of these six and what they mean and why. So if you want like a whole hour long, you can literally listen to her tell us all the amazing stuff. But from a very high level, essentially, she took all the data and research that her father has done in the book. And then they're also creating another book that'll be out in 2018, which is going to be amazing. Even though he'd passed, she kind of had been working with them a lot on it and is finished the research and finished the book. So it's going to be amazing. You probably want to check it out. But from a really high level, essentially, she just took what was present and all the data analysis in the book and kind of took the last 20 years of data and created this software that allow ask by asking questions, allow you to understand kind of what makes the client tick from the level of what kind of behaviors they have and are they likely or not to be financially successful? What's the probability of success? It'll say like, you know, we just, Alan took the test and Alan has short-term focus on the markets. Alan is conservative and Alan likes to know what his neighbor does because he copies everything his neighbor does. So his social inference is super high. That is going to be a really tough client to work with. Yeah. How do you use that? Are, are you using it as a, in a way as a vetting tool for ongoing planning or are you saying, okay, this is, you know, or are you saying, hey, client, 
you know, Alan, this, this is what the results say. This is the thing. And this is how this could affect you long term. So, you know, providing some coaching around developing exactly. that. Providing the coaching around it. So like, again, I take a real interest in the client and I say, you know, hey, Alan, you know, you have this short term focus on the markets and your financial acumen is low. And that's okay because most of my clients, they come in financial acumen low. I highly get someone that's high because if they are, they're most likely a DIY type person. So I'm okay with it being low. Over time, our goal is to increase this. Like by working together, one of the things I love doing personally is just educating people, making sure they're making the best, most informed decision for themselves and their family and their finances. So over time, this will kind of like rub off on them and they will become smarter and making better choices. And I think during that, they'll also become more aware that you can't time the markets. It's time in the market, not timing the market and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. And over time, Alan, I believe that you will become more of a long-term investor, but be aware that right now you're short-term and that, you know, volatility in the markets could worry you. And that you know, I need to know from an advisor, if the market dips 4%, guess what? Alan's probably calling me. Right. So it's kind of a heads up for me. It's kind of a heads up for them. We talk through things. And if I said, you know, Alan, you have a spending problem, right? And that's probably one of the reasons why you came out to me and wanted to work with me. And I look at it and your social indifference is high, meaning that you want to go buy the BMW because the guy next door bought one. You know, we need to have more discussion around spending and their goals and what they're really saving for and put some emotion behind why they're saving in order so they don't go and go, oh, I can afford the BMW and just go do it. You know, so it just (laughs) kind of helps me structure the meetings, the relationships with clients in the future. But they're already a client once they've taken this. It's not like I use it as a vetting tool. I could easily see this as a vetting tool, but I don't look at it that way. If my doctor said, hey, Ryan, get on the scale. Oh, your BMI is over 20. Like, see you, see you later. I'd be like, "Uh oh, like that's probably a really bad doctor. I would want the doctor, if I, my BMI was over 20, like I'd want them to be like taking a notice and wanting to help me lose weight and do things to get better, not shun me because I have some bad habits, clearly eating habits or whatever it was to make my BMI over 20. Yep. No, I, I totally agree. That That's what I was wondering. And the question I had actually asked Sarah at one point was, you know, if someone comes in with, you know, d- doesn't have the right, quote unquote, or isn't very strong in, you know, wealth building habits, do we just tell them we're not going to work with them? Or is there something we can do? And, and of course, she said, you do want to work with them, but you have to be aware of those issues. And and so the, as the client is doing various things or taking various actions, it does make a little more sense because, you know, Rick Kaler told me one time, nothing is irrational when you understand where it comes from. Yeah. So, and that's great. I I think that's truly accurate and great advice that, you know, sometimes we think like, oh my God, this client's so stupid. They went out, bought a BMW, how how dumb. But if you have this assessment and you have that tool, then you say, okay, this is who they are. And we're fighting that natural tendency. And that's okay. Like, and you have to come from the mentality of like wanting to help people. And, and I don't know, Alan, if we're going to talk more into it or not, but like, I literally give away everything. I want to give away as much content, as much things as I could. That's why I started a podcast. That's why I have a blog. That's why I run Facebook groups like dedicated purely for physicians. Like I want as much info out there as I can. Not because I'm like, oh man, I hope someone calls me off that post I just made. It's because I want them literally to (laughs) better themselves. Like I genuinely come from that. I have 80 seats, 70 seats on my bus. Like not that many. I'm almost like I'm over half full. Okay. So why would I go put out a podcast, blogs, you know, be expert panelists and do these things and like help people because I really want to help someone. So I am not about to turn someone down because they have low financial acumen and they really care about what their neighbor wants and they have some really bad habits. I view it as a challenge. I'm excited to take that person on and to help them. And my goal is that working together, like you would change some behaviors. I don't want to change you as a person, but like you will become more aware. And if those purchases really, truly, honestly make you happy, then do them. But if they're not and it's, you know, it's kind of like the person who eats the gallon of ice cream because they're upset. Like if you go shop because you're upset, like let's cut it out and let's do stuff, you know, whether it's traveling or whatever it is that really excites you and make sure that you have the money set aside to do those things versus going and, you know, going on a shopping spree to Nordstrom's or whatever it is. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit more about that. So, I mean, you you are a content machine right now. Do you plan to continue to be a content machine at what point you have your, you said you got 70-ish seats on the bus? Do you, I mean, is that, that's going to be a long play for you or is that primarily you're just focused on marketing for now? 
I, I don't view it as marketing really. And, and this might come from just the position I'm in after seeing how much crap my wife was pitched during training and knowing what I'm unraveling most of the time. And I don't want to mention company names or anything in case, but you know, there's some certain companies that a lot of physicians, they get kind of approached by early in training and sold a bunch of whole life or whatever it is. And you know, half the time I see someone, they come to me and they go, Ryan, my investments cost me way too much a month. And I'm like, Oh, what, what do your investments quote unquote cost you? And you know, I've seen, you know, residents be paying, you know, half their salary to whole life policies. And you're like, Oh, you don't make that much money. Like this is terrible. So <laughs> why? You know, but it's because they're pitched yeah. and, like their attendings were pitched and guess what? Their attendings own this crap. And you know, they don't know better. They didn't take a single, my wife has perfect score on her SAT and ACT. She can't balance a checkbook. Like they never took a course in anything finance related. So it's expected. The industry knows that they prey on it. It's disgusting. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get content out there to help. And there's other people in the, in the area and the niche that I I'm in that provide this. There's a lot of physicians that are bloggers that have probably gotten burned by advisors and have post-traumatic advisor syndrome and went and said, you know what, I'm going to go research and provide this content out there for people. And I'm just trying to, again, provide stuff. It's, you know, I wish I was able to provide more, but I'm one person. I only have a certain amount of time in the day. And again, I want to prioritize spending time with my kids and things as well and making sure that my clients are well taken care of. So I try to produce more content. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but it, it really is coming from the, the mentality of like, I just want to help people. So where are you finding success getting your clients? Because you said in your first year, you made $10,000, which uh, you weren't charging an upfront fee. So you may have been racking up, a, you know, getting some clients in. But then this last year, I mean, if you're at 40 clients now, this has been a good year. So where are you seeing the most traction, you know, inside of your niche and getting these yeah, clients? It's, it's kind of been on a few spots. So one, just producing the content allows more doors to open up and doors that I never thought would happen. The New England Journal of Medicine had a, which is, I guess you want to call it like the Wall Street Journal for us, if you will. It's like the most major publication that they, they can have. And they asked me to be an expert panelist in their financial planning 101 series that had something like 30,000 views. That definitely helped bring and spark some interest. I definitely saw more traffic to the blog. They liked what they saw. They asked me to follow up with more content. So I just had a post go live. I don't know, maybe couple weeks ago definitely saw again increased spike you know i've been on other podcasts i i run two facebook groups one is my own for the podcast similar to you guys having the what is it called xyp and vip community mine's called the financial residency community i only let doctors or spouses of doctors in i think we're close to 600 people now i vet every single one and and how are they finding from the the podcast 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 is just almost at twenty thousand downloads and i've been doing it like I think I'm in my sixth month now, 27 episodes or something. So, you know, people are finding me through iTunes and it's kind of growing. And then I am a kind of co-owner slash admin of the group physician to finance. See the trend, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like you have a niche. <laughs> There's 3,200 doctors in that one and it grows at about a hundred a week. So the ad, the co-admin and I, we, you know, we manage that to make sure that everyone that's coming in is a doctor or married to a doctor, pretty protective of those, not just from like a business standpoint by any means, but more just, I want it to be a safe place for people to talk and ask questions and not get pitched by insurance or whatever it is. So again, married, married to a doctor or, or an actual physician. And then I'm a part of a group called dads married to doctors. See the trend again. <laughs> so <laughs> need to be a dad and married to a doctor to be a part of this group. There's, I think, 3,500 people in this group. They do meetups. I sponsor stuff for them. I've been on their podcast. Did you start this group or this is a group that someone else had? of this group, but I am, I think, one of maybe two or three advisors in the group, and the other two are fee-based. And it's kind of hard to compete when I'm putting out a ton of content and I'm just, I think, a good guy. You know, I'm trying to be a good guy and not trying to sell them products and do things. I literally don't ask anything. I don't ever pitch my services. I just go in and again, I just try to give information away. I spend more time answering questions of people than 
anything else probably that I do. And some might look at that as like, that is a gigantic waste of time. And it might be, I don't know. But all I know is that people see the answers, listen to the podcast, they read the blogs, they they know who I am. My my meetings kind of have changed to not understanding like who I am because they mostly now know I'm everywhere on the internet in this space. It's mostly, you know, does it work for them and do they want help or not? And if they don't like, great, use the blog, use the podcast, use all the stuff, like educate yourself, DIY. And I'm stoked that I helped you. Like if I can just change one person, like it's all worth it. But I'm getting like four or five emails a week now from people asking questions on the financial things, uh, financial residency saying like, thank you so much for putting out this post. Like I almost bought whole life and I read that post, like what timing? It's like, cool. Like, and maybe that was been good and they may have been bad, but like odds are for a resident, like you probably don't need it. So it's probably a good thing that you got saved. Um, so prospects kind of come from all over the place, but you know, in the beginning I was happy to get like two prospects a month and land a client a month. And I'm at the point now where I'm at close to 20 prospects a month. And it's, I limit myself to only two a month for clients. So I already have a list through July, you know, for people that are wanting to work together. So it's, it's going well, but I'm limiting growth to again, make sure service is great and I'm doing the right thing for everyone. And you know, I take it really seriously. If you're going to pay me to do your, you know, to work with you, like I'm going to make sure I do the best job I possibly can. So you, you mentioned having, you know, 70 ish seats on the bus. I mean, is your plan to stop or do you, do you want to grow the firm and start hiring additional advisors to serve these clients? Cause I mean, you're getting just a ton of leads and uh, you've, you've got a platform for growth if you choose to drive that. Yeah. The competitive side of me is like, let's go big. The dad side of me is like, I don't want to grow that big cause I want to be present. And again, knowing your niche, right? So I know doctors are busy. I'm married to one. I, I get it. Saturdays are a big deal. And so I work on Saturdays right now. And Saturdays fill up like crazy. It's like the whole day is, is done. Like client meeting after client meeting on Saturdays. My last meeting starts at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I give that availability because people who have children that work all day, they need some time to meet with their advisor. And it, they're not going to certainly take off work or when advise it. So I have nighttime kind of meetings with clients and it's understanding that where they're at in their, in their careers and how their careers are structured and what they're, you know, just how they operate, you know, allows me to kind of structure. I don't have, even if I wanted to do meetings at eight in the morning, like clients don't reach out until noon. (laughs) Right. And that's the East coast guys that got off and gals that got off at four o'clock and they're like, or three o'clock and they're like, Oh, I've got some time to kill. Let me call Ryan. But other than that, like I, it's a ghost town till noon, basically Pacific. And then it gets busy in the evening and, and that, and that's just the way that I've structured it. And it's really, again, just kind of speaking in the niche and understanding what they want and, and um, how I can serve them better. So what's next for you? I mean, you're doing a ton. Like I said, you've built the foundation with the content. It looks like, you know, based on back in napkin math, you're, you're hitting a hundred thousand run rate. So, you know, even if you don't grow, you'll, you'll hit the six figure this year. And obviously you're going to continue to grow, but you're going to cap it. So what, what's your focus for the next 12 to 24 months as you're sort of, you know, now that the foundation has been laid and, and you're rocking and rolling? Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing because, again, you know, part of the competitor in me is like, let's go big and do this. And, you know, I've got real conflicting things. And, you know, I, I, I want to and I know this isn't a solicited thing, but I, I want to give a shout out to XYPN. Like I've met so many good people and so many amazing people, the group of Guys that I uh, meet with every week, Tim Baker, Mike Roth, and Patrick, we, we, we meet every week. And Patrick's kind of a new addition, but a real welcomed addition. He's a, a great planner, a great person. And, you know, we've been meeting every year or every week for like over two years now. And these guys are kind of like my rock. And, you know, we, we've had this discussion and, and it's tough. It's one of these things like, do I grow big or do I stay small? And I like both, both ways. I like, it's hard. So I don't know. I don't know. Talk to me in a year and I'll be like, Alan, I'm pulling my hair out and I went to 90 and I made a mistake and didn't hire early. Or it could be like, I'm enjoying life and, you know, helping clients. And I stayed at 70. Like, I don't know yet what the best thing is. We'll, we'll kind of see when it gets there. But in terms of that, and then I don't know if you, if you mind me chatting on 
long body at all, but uh, oh yeah, absolutely. You guys were amazing and, and allowed me to participate. I would say in the fintech competition last year with long body that was in our alpha stage, and I know that you probably can feel the pain of working with development and how it all kind of goes and how this is so different than financial planning. Yes, it is <laughs> so different. <laughs> But I'm so excited to say that, you know, we went to, to XYPN and we're a part of the, the competition and with so many great, great companies. And Loan Buddy is just going into beta right now. Congratulations. So tell, so tell listeners what Loan Buddy does. Yeah. So Loan Buddy is just a, a student loan software that, you know, I kind of look at it, right? Every, it was something that I wish existed that I didn't create, that someone created and took all the risk and challenge. And had done that. On, <laughs> I like. I really wish you guys had done it. No offense. Like, just throw it onto your plate because you don't I have you. more than six hundred thousand things going on. But it's just something that was really needed in the marketplace. Like, I'm sick of you know macroing stuff into Excel and then trying to get all things together. And and so Loan Buddy basically is it parses the data and makes everything that took me two hours literally two seconds. I've had some buddies, all XYPN people guys and gals, you know, help me through the process of the alpha testing it. And, you know, one of them actually told me a somewhat funny story that I, I appreciated. They were going into a meeting with a client that they needed to provide some student loan analysis for, and they completely dropped the ball and forgot. They, while the client was knocking on the virtual door, you know, into Zoom, they pulled up loan body, threw in the, the NSLDS text file started the meeting, shared the screen. And even though the loan buddy wasn't meant to just share the screen and work through it with clients, it's really meant for the advisor. It still served its purpose. They still went through, provided all the right things because it shows all the data there in a nice, clean, easy format, click, one-click PDF. So it's something that I wish existed that didn't exist. And I'm really excited that we're in beta. And like I mentioned in the fintech competition, like I really do appreciate XYPN and, and everything you guys are doing. So XYPN members will always have a 50% lifetime discount regardless of what Woohoo. the, yeah, surprise, <laughs> will always have <laughs> that regardless of what the, the actual thing is. And then beta users are, you know, if you want to become a founding member and help us grow and help us kind of get through this, this is really going to be community driven. This is something that I, I you know, this isn't my full-time job. This is something I wish existed for all of us. And ultimately it's about giving our clients the best advice and this tool I know does that and it does it in a more efficient manner. If you're someone how I used to be where you charge $500 to do some student loan analysis, like this is a no brainer for you. If you do the occasional student loan analysis, I think it'll help. But really, it's for those that do a lot of student loan analysis for clients. It's just the tool that is needed. And, you know, it's going to be community driven. I'm going to take all the feedback and, you know, let people, you know, all the founding members are going to get to vote on what we're building next. And, really all the, the money goes to just paying the developers to make this even more awesome. It's not like I'm going to be dependent on it. I'm, I'm just really excited to, to, to launch it and it's, it's out in beta form and really, really excited to do that. And Alan, I don't know what the best way is to, to make sure that XOPN knows they get the discount, but that will always be there just as a, an appreciation for everything you guys have done for, for me, my firm and, and for my friends' firms, you know, cause I've, I've really gotten to know some really amazing lifelong friends through XYPN. Thank you for that. Student loan software for advisors is one of those hyper niche products that no one has built because you can't make a billion dollars on it. And you don't build software to make a million dollars. It, it needs to have a B, not an M. And so it takes someone, one, with the expertise, which you have, and then two, the, the willingness to build something that isn't necessary. I mean, and who knows, it could blow up and be a $100 million software. And, and you know, one day you look back and go, wow, what did I do? But you know, who knows? It does take someone that, to jump in there and build it because they need it, which is where so much, you know, so much of the tech in, in financial planning comes from. So what is, your, what is the URL for Loan Buddy? Yeah, it's, it's loanbuddy.us. Loanbuddy.us. So we'll link to that in the show notes as well. So go check that out if you are doing student loan work. You know, again, we've never had a tool like this. It was just like, go like get your client's password to, you know, directloans.gov and, and you know, go check them out. Yeah, the National Student Loan Day <laughs> Service area and like kind of figure out or have them like do it and send you this text file and then you import everything to Excel and then pray that it all kind of imported correctly and you're checking data all the time, or at least you should be making sure it all imported correctly and everything. So, you know, it's still in its beta form. It's not going to be perfect, but 
you know, there, there's so much on the roadmap and I'm going to make this the most expansive calculator that's out there, you know, and, and the ability to pull in private loans along with public loans is something that no other calculator does. And, you know, that's on the roadmap coming soon. So right now it's, it's, you know, it parses the data, makes everything pretty, you know, one click PDFs, you will understand kind of where all their loans are, what's in repayment, what isn't in repayment. It kind of gives you the little nod to what you've been doing, how many clients you've ran through the software, how much debt you've analyzed, you know, so the advisor can kind of understand kind of like the, how much AUM do you manage in this kind of space? It's like, how much debt have you advised on kind of thing? So, but there's so much coming. I'm so excited to finally get this released in in a reality. And I know just from the alpha users that really depend on it for this business, like I know that it's helpful and the price point is going to be pretty affordable for everyone, especially XYPN members. Yeah. And if anyone needs to get talked out of building tech, call me or call Ryan. Oh no, call call me. (laughs) (laughs) It's exciting. It's fun. And probably the most frustrating thing possible. I, it, you know, I, I imagine it's like having, I never experienced a terrible twos with my son. It, it was really the terrible early threes. Like to me, it's just like having an army of terrible threes always. And like, sometimes they're really cute and fun. And then the rest of the time you're trying to pull your hair out. So, so you guys remember all the, all the things I said that sounded kind of negative and I didn't mean to be, cause I'm a really glass half full kind of guy, but all the kind of things I said negative on like starting your own business, that is a drop in the bucket to compare <laughs> To, so to true. actually developing a product. Yeah, tech is just a different, particularly if you are not a developer that, you know, and, and I'm not either. Like I can barely type HTML code to update a color on a website. So like... If, I still can't do that. As a non-techie, it, it's, it can be done. And maybe maybe we do a podcast separately on if you choose to go develop software, how to, how to do it right. But it just looks so easy. Like I'm just going to turn my Excel spreadsheet into software. That's no big deal. So easy, but is not. And this is the third developer that I'm using, but now it's a world-class developer that has experience. Like one of their things that they've created has like seven figure income per year. So like these guys are big. These guys are great. They're amazing, amazing team to work with. And I'm so fortunate that I've kind of networked in and they've decided to kind of take on loan body as a, a project with me. And, but it's, it's not, it's not easy. So if you're thinking about it, like just Start an RA because it's a whole lot easier. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. So on that note, as we're coming to a close, if you will, share that one piece of advice, the one thing that you wish you could go back and tell your younger self, the one thing you've learned that that you know now, what do you think that one piece of advice would be? Oh, man, I've learned from so many of my mistakes that I probably could do a whole podcast episode on it. Actually, I know I could. But I would, I would really look back and say, you know, if I was just coming out of school or just about to start a business, whatever it is, like, and this sounds maybe a little bit different, but focus on a niche, focus on what you enjoy and what you would want to do. Because this generic kind of like, I'm going to target the world and talk to everyone. It, it really honestly doesn't work. And what does work is when you know what your client's problems are before they even speak. And, and that's the truth. Like when a prospect comes to me, I just need to know where they're at in, in their, in their career. If you're a resident. I know exactly what you're going through. If you're a new attending. I know what you're going through. If you're a med student. I know exactly what you're going through. You don't even have to tell me unless your family is oil tycoons and you have a trust fund and things are very different in that sense, which could happen, but not rarely. It's got to be really rare for the most part. Like clients have like 80% the same problems. So I already know what's coming. So my, my advice is, you know, pick a niche and just know everything about it. Make sure you, you really can relate to what they're doing and really have your services all around that. When I had more choices and more options that I thought were good and in theory, they still probably are good, but it, it gave people more things to think about and more potential things to say no to, or that didn't relate. But now it's like, I do everything for you all for one fee. There's no really like deciding other than how much money do you have to invest? And if you're under a certain amount, like this is your fee, take it or leave it, go find someone else. Heck, I'll refer you to someone comes to me, Alan says like, and they're like my most perfect client. You know, they, let's say are two years out of training. They make half a million bucks. They have no student debt. And they said, but I just want a one-off plan. I will refer them to the seven other planners that I'm now good friends with. And we all have a once a month mastermind. I will gladly refer you to one of them if you 
just want a one-off plan. Sure. I, I don't want to work with someone that's a one-off plan. Like I know me, I know my business, I know what I want to do. And that is a really big thing. And just having that network, like there's no competitors here. They're, we're all friends. Like we're talking about how we can even collaborate more together. And we all literally focus on the same thing, young physicians. And we're talking about how we can collaborate more together. So have that abundance mindset, know what you want to do and just come from a, a place of giving and not, not receiving. And I think you'll do pretty well in the business. Well, thank you for that advice. And, and thank you for taking the time to come on and, and share your story and, and just your path. Cause it's been, sounds like you're in a really good spot. Like I said, if we had talked six months ago, eight months ago in that, in the middle of that, like, what did I do moment? I might've had a little bit different attitude to share, which is awesome as well. So it just takes time. It does. And, and it's the one thing you can't speed up. Like nothing you do will speed it up. It just takes time. Yeah. You got to build the trust, right? There's, you know, by putting out a ton of content, like what is it, Alan? Like it's like someone has to see something seven times before they're like, oh, I should probably buy that. Like it's probably even more in content marketing. And with something expensive, quote unquote expensive, like it, this is a big purchase. This is not a small thing. And and again, you're even if it was cheap, you're talking about money. No one wants to talk about money. So yeah, yeah they, they, they have a real reason. This. They have a real reason for calling you. Like it's not because they're like, man, I heard Alan's like a cool guy and I listen to his podcast and this guy sounds fun. I'm going to call him and tell him everything about me. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Like what happened in their life, that transition, right? Something happened and they're reaching out because now they're stuck and they need your help. It's not because they heard you and read your post and was like, oh man, he writes really well. I'm going to reach out. Yeah, to I him. really should talk to a stranger about money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Ryan, thank you again for, for coming on the show. Of course. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. And you know, thank you again for, for everything XYPN does. What highly repetitive tasks are you doing that take up your time and keep you from seeing more clients? Tasks like data input, building financial plans, document organization, and more? What if all of these tasks were done by a trained professional who could complete them with quality, accuracy, and efficiency? Valenta BPO provides virtual assistant and paraplanner outsourcing solutions specifically for financial advisors and the financial planning industry. Check them out at valentabpo.com to see how they can help you do more of what only you can do. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYP and radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes with myself and Kitsis, and to finally find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone, and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.